Texas political consultant and activist Ken Flippin has created a new political action committee. The PAC is focused on local races that have a chance to unseat a Republican incumbent. If you don't have somebody that can kind of walk you through, like if you end up on environmental reg or, uh, you know, any of the, you know, uh, uh, committees that involve the environment, which there are like four, um, it's hard to navigate all those issues. So the point of the pack is, because I've been working in environmental policy for some time, is to help them prepare for before the session and then during the session. Uh, for that. So, and, and the house seats that I'm targeting all are, you know, uh, public school supporters that are trying to oust pro voucher Republicans. And there's about five or six across the state that we have a chance of winning. And what I've heard is that we need to win three and we'll be able to stop vouchers. Hey, welcome everybody to another episode of the Plutopia Podcast. I'm John Lebkowski, and my partner over there, Scoop Sweeney, is my co-host, and I am his co-host today. And we are going to be interviewing Kenneth Flippin. Ken Flippin, a legislative policy and advocacy consultant, a political and community organizer uh, in Texas. He's worked all over Texas as a campaign manager, community organizer, and he's been a consultant to local and state and national political campaigns, issue campaigns. And now he's started a new political action committee, a new PAC called the Green Wave PAC, which is intended to drive meaningful environmental change in Texas by pioneering an environmental political campaign model. And that sounds pretty fantastic. And I'll just add that we're just all three a bunch of West Texas boys. Scoop and I are from Big Spring, and Ken is from San Angelo. So how you doing, Ken? I'm doing great. And yeah, West Texas um, boys tend to end up here in Central Texas, don't we? Yeah, we absolutely do. For survival. (laughs) I still come down here at high speed. And it's tough. Scoop went all the way out to the Bay Area and hid out there for a long time. But now you're back, right? Uh, l- last time I checked. I... <laughs> <laughs> so, Ken, I got to ask you. Uh, so you kind of started out as a, a circuit preacher, right? Yeah, a long time ago when I was... Uh... A long time ago. Yeah, when I, when I was... <laughs> basically a teenager um there was a little church that i went to with my mom after i went to church with my dad my dad was a retired baptist preacher at this point but had a lot of preachers in my mom's family too so after we went to the baptist church for sunday school we'd go over to the church of christ and so i i was raised kind of in both churches and then there was a little preaching school connected to it I took all these preaching classes while I was a teenager. And then next thing you know, they had me go into these little bitty churches in Eden and El Dorado right outside of San Angelo. Oh, man. Preaching at age 16 to basically the average crowd was about 15 people, average age 70. But um, I enjoyed it. (laughs) So did this, did this, uh, did, did this prepare you for politics? Um, well, it, it did in a lot of ways. Um, one thing my, my speech coach would would say is that I wasn't a very good public speaker uh, when I started doing speech and debate, and he made me a whole lot better, which is true. But I had a little bit of experience in preaching at the time, and so I think it helped me there. Um, the other thing is that, you know, the Church of Christ does a whole lot of, you know, the Bible says what the doctrine is and you kind of interpret it for yourself or the church interprets it for their congregation so there is a kind of a vigorous study of the bible and how it applies to the day that was emphasized that i think was valuable but was what was real interesting was the fact that you know back when i was doing that which was in the 80s um 
that was when the religious right was really starting to find its roots. And the church itself, you didn't really feel it in the church until about that time. And there were all these different things that started seeping into the church to make it okay to bring up politics from the pulpit and especially conservative politics. And I saw that coming in right as I was preaching, but it really wasn't affecting us because we were so small. Um, I mean, it was coming in, but just piece by piece. And and the contrast between how it was looked at in the church before politics was like, well, you didn't talk about church, politics in the church, but you'd talk about it in the parking lot is kind of the way that we we you know, people would say it. Uh, but all that started getting where it's real confrontational to talk politics um, because you had to be with, their, you know, these religious right folks that were worried about the schools corrupting people and all these things that they started putting into that. So being a witness to that, um, it made me, I think, a little more aware of the importance of politics being separated from from faith and it made me more uh you know like yeah i'm a christian but i'm also a democrat and we should be able to be fine with that because i mean that was the thing it was all about abortion back then it wasn't really uh you know some of these other uh social issues but it was about oh well you're for killing babies basically <laughs> you know like this this fact that you could have a different mentality and it be okay to still be part of the church that was definitely starting to change right when I was a preacher. What do you think about the way that the uh, conservative Christians have reacted to the various crimes of Donald Trump? Well, it, it's been, for me, a, a grave disappointment because it's like, on one hand, I could see the church like becoming separated because of politics and that bugged me some but now that you've got somebody who's so hypocritical about those views in the way that he lives and his his lifestyle and the fact that so many of the conservative christians entered into you know a relationship with him in the same way that i think a lot of people do politics very transactional, like get us what we want and we'll give you our votes. It doesn't matter what your character is. And going from that, from Carter, you know, who I think the religious right to me came up because they saw Carter and they thought we're going to lose the whole damn thing forever. And they were right. And I think that was the only route to, to really make things, but yeah, it, it it's, I've lost friendships. Um, I've had family members uh, that I can't communicate with anymore. Um, I've had people of faith that, like, I can't have a discussion about faith with them anymore because of Trump. And so, to me, it's it's um, it's disappointing because I feel like he, the church has really, the modern American Christian church has really destroyed itself at the political altar of the Republican Party, and I've seen it, and it, it just, it, 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 to me, I'm more worried about what it did to the church than what it did to our politics, but obviously it's done a lot of nasty thing to our politics as well. Well, I think there's probably some evidence of Trump's divinity because there's been a miracle. His ear got shot off and it grew back the next day. <laughs> I don't know how that, how, how did that happen? <laughs> anyway, well, you know, when, so, when, well, that, <laughs> when that happened, I have to say that <laughs> even I uh, thought of that scripture in Revelations where um, it talks about the, the beast having his uh, uh, injury to the head that he survives <clears throat> and all of this kind of stuff. And I thought, man, if this happened to a Democratic candidate, they'd be like, oh, he's clearly the Antichrist. <laughs> you know, so to well, me I mean, there's probably a lot of evidence that Trump is the Antichrist. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I know some people 
that have built that evidence up and totally believe it. And, you know, t to me, as a Christian, like, we don't, first off, I don't think I have, I think it's the height of self-righteousness to project whether somebody else is a Christian or not. To me, that's not what the Bible says. And so they're already kind of into that 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 hypocritical uh, perspective, something they're not even like, you know, shameful of anymore. But um, from my perspective, I can't be judgmental of their of their faith relationship with God or their status after life because that I'm just doing the same thing. So you know, I as much as I have my feelings about how their self-righteousness may affect their relationship and the genuineness of it. Like there's no room for me, me to judge that because I've got all my own, you know, shortcomings when it comes to my own faith walk. And so, you know, that, and that's how, you know, I wish they had that perspective so that we could have those conversations again. Um, and maybe someday, maybe it'll change, but right now it's at a place where hmm. it's like, you know, Sometimes you just got to let things go and and maybe things yeah, will change. Yeah, absolutely. You know, whether it's because, you know, uh, you know, a person that's gay coming out to their family and so forth or, you know, how we're divided politically now, there may be a time that you can have conversations that you can't have right now. So, you've been in politics, I guess for a couple of decades now, if not longer but how did you how did you get drawn into politics of well, all things it's really so i'm 51 and and i've actually been i think like always drawn to politics when kind of my mom w would always tell me the story and i remember it a little bit myself is um i was the only kid in my first grade class that voted for J jimmy carter and then when he lost i w i cried that night i'm in first grade and i'm crying when Jimmy Carter loses to, to Ronald Reagan. Um, you know, when I was in high school, I was volunteering for a local state rep candidate before I could vote. And I, I, I it's something about my, I think a lot of it had to do with my mom being a teacher, being a union member. Um, at one point, she was on top of what they called the career ladder. And they tried to get rid of her because she was basically making about twice as much as a starting teacher, which was making essentially minimum wage at the time. So it was still barely enough to take care of our family because my mom was a single mom at the time. Um, and she had fought hard and worked hard to get that, but they were trying to get rid of her. Um, a principal was, and the union came in and a student from every one of her classes came in and spoke to the school board and they did fire her because she was an outstanding teacher. Um, but um, she would take me to national conferences of the NEA and I got to see Bill Clinton speak and all this stuff. So, and this was in my teenage years and just seeing how the union stood behind her when she was, you know, being attacked as like a bad teacher, even though like 10 years previous, she'd gotten all super evaluations um, it just showed how important unions are, and especially to teachers. And it just made me realize, like, there's these progressive, more, you know, uh, you know, but at the same time, being in West Texas, as you know, like most people were more conservative, but I really enjoyed, because of speech and debate, the conversations and the arguments and the discussions you would get in back and forth. But I was definitely leaning left uh, very early on mostly because of my mama, partially because of my daddy too. He was um, he was a Democrat, said uh, Nixon was the last Republican he voted for. And after that, he's never going to vote for a Republican again. <laughs> yeah, I grew up in a family of women who were all school teachers, including my mom, who actually came and taught my fifth grade class much to my uh, horror. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't tell me she was until I, she showed up at the desk in front of the class. It's like, oh, that's my mother. And I remember teachers and uh, I mean, I talked to all my you know, female relatives who were teaching for many years and they loved doing it. And it wasn't, they, were be they weren't being attacked. 
like teachers are being assaulted these way, you know, politically assaulted because of just them being good teachers. It's not enough apparently these days for them to be a, a good teacher. They have to be uh, teaching the, what you know, the powers that be in Texas think is proper teaching. And it's pretty frightening to see that happening to t people like teachers. Yeah, maybe it is. And my mom would always say, after she'd retired, I, she inspired a few of my nieces and cousins to teach. She'd say, I don't know if I could do it anymore. They're making it so hard on them. And, um, you know, they have made it harder. And I have such enormous respect uh, for educators. And I encourage people to go into education. But I've, I've had friends that want to go into education. And they tell me, I can make more delivering pizza, you know, part-time than I can doing uh becoming an educator <laughs> and it's like i believe you and i you know i understand why people make the decisions they make and especially in texas we've always lagged behind we've not treated our teachers professionally and that's part of why we need to change our leadership in this state well absolutely i mean the whole school voucher thing is uh you know seems to be an attempt to undermine the public school system and um, i can't really imagine what this country would be if we if if we well i if we got rid of public schools really i mean if we got if we had everybody going to private schools or church schools or whatever but of course it really can't work. You can see how the rural people in Texas are reacting to that. They know that they won't have any schools for their kids if, if, uh, if we get to an extreme of what's being proposed. Yeah. yeah have you been true. involved with that at all? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, it's kind of funny. So I have a niece uh, that's uh, a superintendent and, and she sees that and she goes and lobbies against, um, uh, vouchers. My mom always called vouchers vultures. Um, yeah, part of what I'm doing, in fact, um, I, you see, I've got my Texans for Kamala shirt and hat. And um, so part of what I'm doing right now is I've started a pack and part of the pack, we're selling merchandise and Part of that PAC money, I'm also giving to state rep candidates that are Democrats that are in winnable House seats right now. And so I, I call it the green wave, like, you know, ocean wave uh, PAC. I call it that because we want to work not just in the election cycle, but we also want to work in the legislative cycle or the, what I call the policy cycle. And then the next legislative, the next election cycle and the next policy cycle again and again, because as you know, in Texas, we only had the legislature meet every other year, but it also happens to contrast with election years. And so the idea is to work with these uh, Democrats that are going to be newly elected officials, hopefully, if we put them over the top um, and help them as they go into the legislature, be prepared for environmental um, issues, because there are a lot of things to deal with as a state legislature. There's like tons of water issues, tons of environmental quality issues that the state actually manages and so forth. And all this comes at you and like, you know, you've got basically five months to, to learn how to drink from my fire hydrant and if you don't have somebody that can kind of walk you through like if you end up on environmental reg or uh, you know any of the you know uh, uh committees that inv involve the environment which there are like four um it's hard to navigate all those issues so the point of the pack is because i've been working in environmental policy for some time is to help them prepare for before the session and then during the session uh, for that. So, and, and the house seats that I'm targeting all are, you know, uh, public school supporters that are trying to oust pro-voucher Republicans. 
and there's about five or six across the state that we have a chance of winning. And what I've heard is that we need to win three and we'll be able to stop vouchers. And so just doing what little bits we can to help those candidates. There's a lot of other PACs and groups that raise a lot more money than, than what I do. But what I'm trying to do is help them on the margins in the last few weeks with a few dollars. And then again, to build a relationship moving forward to the legislative session uh, so that they can be successful legislators um, as well as successful candidates. Well, we hear a lot of people talk about PACs, political action committees, but uh, I think a lot of people don't have a clue what that really means. What exactly is a PAC and, and what were the mechanics of setting it up? Sure. Um, I'm glad to talk about it because I've been doing it a few times and, you know, PACs sound like these scary, horrible things. Uh, I think super PACs have given like this whole new reputation to what PACs are and what they do. But a PAC, P-A-C, just stands for Political Action Committee. And if you look up like the Texas Education or the Texas Ethics Commission website and, you know, it's pretty easy to file a pack. All it is is literally a grouping of people. Now it can also be a business or it can be organized in a few different ways, but in most cases, it's just a committee is what? A bunch of people that decide they have similar values or similar interest. And obviously they have something that involves a campaign, whether that's an issue campaign or in vast majority of cases, it's a political campaign or contributing to multiple political campaigns. And so there's literally like thousands of PACs uh, filed. There's state PACs and there's federal PACs. What I've filed is a state PAC, um, and that means I can only spend money on state races. Um, I can't give money to a federal candidate like uh, Colin Allred. Uh, but a state house seat or a lo another local PAC that represents, like if you had a Democratic club, they could form a PAC. But you could also just form a PAC one person. Now, it really technically is supposed to be multiple people and all that, but like you could literally have a PAC of two people. Uh, but the idea of a PAC is let's have some specific political goal that we as a group want to achieve you raise money and then you spend it and you know you have to report to the Te texas ethics commission on a regular basis uh, to make it clear where the money came from and what you're spending it on and and so it's a way to keep everybody kind of um, at least transparent, if not a level of fairness, so that you know if somebody came in and from out of state and spent, you know, fifty million dollars in a campaign, it's registered. You can see where that money came from, and so all of this is available to be seen by the public and the news media and so forth. And so that ability to have that transparency, to know who is contributing to what campaigns. And where that money then goes to, what packs and what packs go to what campaigns, uh, it's just a matter of transparency so that the public can see how all of the politic political money is is going. And then, of course, there's the super packs and all of that, which is a totally different thing. Those are people with have a ton of money, um, which is not us, but um, they they do have an enormous influence on our elections nowadays, especially after the decisions that made super PACs able to essentially do whatever they want. <laughs> I like the idea that you're concentrating on local races because those are really important and you're able to actually accomplish things at that level on the national level. It's really hard if you're not you know, related to the Adelson family or <laughs> one of the big buck, you know, contributors, because those people pretty much, are, you know, they're, they're the tail that wags the dog. But in a local level, you could really get things accomplished that are ha have good you know, impact on your lives. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some of these races are literally going to be determined by a few hundred votes. 
And, you know, when you tell people that, um, I think it, it gives them not only more of a reason to vote, but to vote down ballot. And so a lot of that is where, like, there's a race, there's two races in San Antonio that are um, pretty competitive. And literally, it could be a couple thousand dollars spent just the right way at just the right time could determine uh, who wins uh, one or two of those seats. And so that's where, you know, it may not be the money from, from my pack that makes a difference and anybody that contributes in these close races. But that's that's why local races are so much more fun because you could actually see your impact. What's the the political mix in Texas? We, we hear, we've heard people for a while now say that Texas uh, is liable to turn purple at some point, but it doesn't ever seem to happen. I'm just kind of wondering, I mean, it seems that, that the rural, uh, the urban areas rather in Texas tend to be pretty blue and the rural areas tend to be pretty red and some of the races are pretty close the statewide races i'm just wondering kind of what are you seeing when you when you're working in texas do you get a sense that democrats are starting to get any kind of traction in texas and if not you know kind of what is the problem that democrats are having well, and, and and I'll say this: I think the Democratic Party is ha, ha, has the same problem it's always had, which is um, I think it was Mark Twain who said, "You know, I'm uh, not a member of a organized political party; I'm a Democrat, or something like that." Um, and, and essentially, that is our problem: is like the Democrat to Democrats to me, at least as long as I've been around, we are uh, a coalition of many different groups, and it's working out all of those differences that kind of turns us into an organized, like disorganized mess. Um, and it creates a lot of conflict and a lot of identity politics. Um, at the same time, um, the Republican Party has transformed itself into such a, like, you know, uh, I guess I'd say a personality driven, if not like almost cultish um, uh, phenomenon since Trump that I think in contrast what the Democratic Party at least for the last six or eight years have been doing in Texas could potentially bridge that gap. And, and so like obviously there is a demographic issue that's been moving in our favor. Um, the way that people talk about it is in 2012, um, Obama lost by 16, 2016, it was down to 11, uh, 2020, it was down to, um, or let's see, I think it was by 2020, we're down to like six points. And, and so like every cycle we moved up about one point a year on average. And if you look at that, we should be about one. But of course, you know, con contests go up and down based on the personality. Like Beto got incredibly close to beating Cruz. So what I see is, is that in the urban areas, we have very good democratic strongholds and we have very organized political uh, parties uh, like Travis County is incredibly organized and have their stuff together. Um, Bear County has their stuff together pretty well. But like in Houston, I've worked in Houston. Oh my gosh, it's insane. Like, and, and I, I blame no one and everyone because it's like, it's so big, it's hard to organize anything in that city, much less a political party to get active. But there's tons of great work being done in Houston. And so if you look across the state, there's, collectively definitely enough work being done and we've got the right candidate that like i literally predict like my prediction is that all red wins by about one point and that would be a remarkable day now i also think that they'll say that 
we cheated somehow and probably try to throw out results from South Texas that they don't like and a Houston that they don't like and try to literally give it to Cruz. That's my other prediction. But then I think Kamala will come in about three points um, down, which is, you know, right in line with what we expect, maybe down to two or under two. And, and I think we will pick up about five to six house seats if we're if we're lucky in those things swinging that way maybe just two or three but it could be up to five or six if things go well um in the right places and i think it sets us up for next cycle um i think we could w win statewide especially against um the lieutenant governor um or against paxton if he is still in there i also predict that he will uh, have the FBI um, knocking at his door probably before the year is out, if not early next year. And I think that will affect his election cycle. And so can we beat the governor? I don't know. Right candidate? Possibly. Um, but, you know, I think we'll be competitive moving forward. Um, the last time we had Obama, we made so much progress when we had Obama Hillary because we had so many people come out and we were able to build off of that. And I think the same thing is happening this cycle. Uh, next cycle, turnout will be lower, but it's more about getting the people back, getting your people back out versus them getting their people back out. So I'm, I'm hopeful, but at the same time, we've got a lot of work and uh, you know, national money has to shift its priorities and all that. But I think if Colin Allred wins, the real election I'm looking for is his reelection in 2030. I think that's when we flip the governorship because that's the year that the governorship will line up with that Senate race is 2030. So that's kind of the year I predict we will flip Texas blue. What do you think Colin Allred has to do to win this election? Mostly what he has been doing, which is run a smart campaign that doesn't make him look like Beto. I mean, I love Beto, but, you know, like the, you know, people that are worried about their guns, but also think that Cruz is a Yahoo that whatever, like he just needs to not appear like Beto to enough of those folks um, and I think he can win. I mean, he's, he's, you know, th they are now getting him out there more and he's, you know, showing a real ground campaign. We've got a person right here in Taylor that covers Taylor and Hutto and we're doing canvassing. We've got volunteers this coming Saturday and we had them last Saturday canvassing for Colin Allred. And that's who we're canvassing for. Like we're wearing this material and it, covers Kamala all the way down to our local Sheriff Gleason and our local state rep seat that we're trying to flip and all that kind of stuff. But it's all red that I feel like is like where people like, you know, feel the energy. And, and I, you know, I think if he keeps doing what he's doing, he'll be fine. Let's be hopeful. <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> you know? idea, the idea of uh, somebody getting rid of Cruz is uh, very tempting to just pray for that, but basically because he's uh, not exactly been uh, a great representative for anything other than uh, his own interest. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, I've heard of people that have been in um, control groups studying the election and um, he, he is vulnerable He's definitely vulnerable. We'll just see. I mean, I I just hope that um, we're all pleased on election day to finally, uh, he can go to Cancun all he wants, you know, once he's no longer. <laughs> I'm thinking about what Al Franken said about him. He said, I, I was his best friend in the Senate and I hate him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's um, just not a very likable guy. Yeah. And uh and he's I he's kind of prone to gaffes. I mean this that whole thing about taking off to Cancun when he did was um that wasn't a very good look for him. Uh but how about other races? Are there other races in the state that 
are looking promising that that have real visibility? Yeah. So, you know, I haven't really looked at the congressional races, to be honest. I, I know that there are a couple that they say are are possible, uh, one down in the valley, and I believe there's there's one up in the DFW area that think they think that they can swing. I've been focusing on the state house. And so I'll, I'll mention that there's two races down in San Antonio that I know um, are uh, competitive. Um, those two seats are both ones that um, they've been really close in past elections. Um, and we've got really good candidates and we've got Republicans that are far to the right. Um, in one case, we've got one of the pro uh, voucher candidates that removed an incumbent. And that incumbent um, was pretty popular in a Democrat, you know, a Democratic leaning district. But now you got a right winger and um, Laurel Swift, um, Laurel Jordan Swift um, is the candidate down there that um, I've already uh, committed a little bit of money to her uh, campaign because she represents that part of Alamo Heights that I've run campaigns in the past. And I have a friend down there that's selling our merch. And I made an agreement if a quarter of the merch that we sold would, would go to her. So I've already raised some money for Laurel Swift. And then there's Christian Carranza, I believe is her name, is the other House candidate down there that's in a very swingable district. Those are two. And then up in the DFW area, um, Angie Chin Button is being faced by Avery Bishop. And that's a race that uh, people are talking about uh, is very swingable. Um, and then there's a couple more races up there that are considered swingable. And then there's a race down in the Valley that um, is considered a swingable race. So I think in total, there's about six that are ones the Democrats can definitely win if the, if everything goes right. And there's like three that they're very prone on defending because, you know, they're, they're also swing districts, but they're ones we happen to control at the moment. How about Kristen Hook versus Chip Roy? Well, that's an interesting one because I literally um, heard an interview on the radio yesterday as I was driving or the day before yesterday as driving back from uh, San Antonio attending the rally um, that uh, Imhoff, the first second man, had down there. And, um, you know, Chip Roy is such a... you know, radical, but also such a, know. a sour puss kind of attitude that I feel like a, a female running against him that has the right message. And I was just blown away at how good her message is. Now, that district, as far as I know, is about probably an R plus 12. And so it, it would take a, probably a concerted, repeated effort. But um she pointed out in her interview that she's met with a lot of Republicans that are supporting her. And so, and she comes from a Republican family. So she might just be the, the right candidate. I mean, that would be incredible. But um, again, that, that a lot of these districts at one point, they, they've been rearranged to make it easier for the Republicans to hold longer. And I think that that is one of those that they gave him that extra boost to keep him there till 2030. But it'd be great to break that formula and to beat Chip Roy because he's, he, to me, he's the leader of the insurrection as far as I'm concerned from, from uh, Texas. Like he, 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 you know, pushes the radical stuff that makes people feel like violence is okay. And I, I just, I can't respect that at all. Yeah. He's been a big Trump cheerleader. And I think that uh, is going to, in the long run, weaken him because a lot of Republicans are being 
uh, very vocal about how they would really like to have their party back. They don't want to be a member of a cult. And that's basically what it's turned into is the cult of Trump. Yeah. And, and, and I, I even heard somebody call in and say that that was a Republican. Um, and so I'm hopeful. Um, again, those congressional seats are another thing. It's like, you know, if they get enough money and it's a really, really bad day for Trump, which it could be like they're talking about how as more and more of this momentum is building up, that there's more and more Republicans that may just, you know, either stay home or you just quietly, you know, vote um, the other side because they they see the writing on the wall. But who, who knows, you know, like. We're so partisan now. Um, I think that's that's a lot of wishful thinking. We we've got to be we've got to work on, you know. It goes back to what you were saying about Texas before. I, I before I did this, I went with Ian Davis and we went and hit an apartment complex in Hutto with voter registration cards. Okay, we've already covered all of Taylor. Now we're moving over to Hutto, um, and it's getting those young people registered and getting them to vote it's to me it's not about the persuasion of the republicans that like if if they've stuck with trump this long you know maybe they'll come back our our way a little bit but that's always going to be a battle back and forth it's more about getting the next generation registered and used to voting and then re-engaging them again next election cycle that you know to me that's why the green wave it's like cycle after cycle after cycle. My goal of the Greenway Pack is by 2030 to have, if we can't get to a majority Democrat in the Texas House, at least we can get to a majority, what I call, um, you know, eco or um, climate conscious or climate aware or climate realistic. You know, it's like there are Republicans that recognize climate change will vote with us on some bills and we you know we only need maybe eight or ten to support us regularly if we get close to majority and that's why you know you got to just keep working every cycle and, and pick up a couple more seats and and, and you know d don't worry about the fact that some of these trump folks are going to come back our way but then they may run back when they get another decent republican <clears throat> um and and and, that, and that's fine. I'd rather it be that. That's I'm I'm used to getting back to that, is us having policy debates, um, and not you know, saving the world from fascism debates. You know, well, Texas seems to be a little bit schizophrenic about uh, clean energy and and climate change and that sort of thing. Uh, partly because we have the fossil fuel industry here, and it's like you you really can't deny that anthropogenic climate change is happening and that it is looking extremely dangerous, uh, difficult, you know, difficult road ahead. And you also can't deny that there's a significant clean energy industry sector in Texas that's doing very, very well. Texas is, actually is a state that leads in clean energy. But at the same time, we have this strong tradition of, of fossil fuel economy in Texas, and um, and those people have a lot of sway in the state, uh, even still. Um, how are you, like, what kind of discussions are you having with the fossil fuel people, if at all? Well, you know, it's, it, it's funny because, like, I, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, my work at the legislature, I've been working at the ledge on and off um either for legislators or as what i call an advocacy consultant or basically a lobbyist but because they're environmental nonprofits they really don't have the money to pay a lobbyist so you know it, it it's more consulting than lobbying but in all of those years what i've been seeing is the oil and gas industry you know they are the bread and butter for the state legislature because of how they essentially supported our education system for so long <laughs> and you know they they use that sway 
to basically build um, protections against, you know, incursions from other energy. And, and I see it right now um, at the legislature because, like, as we're dealing with, first off, the incredibly rapid growth of the state, which means rapid growth, rapid demand for energy is going on. And we've got ERCOT managing it and what this, you know, when we had the outages and all that, well, how do we avoid those outages? Well, the right's trying to blame renewable energies when it's like Texas is buying all this stuff and we're buying it because it's cheaper, not because it's green, right? Like we over, we had a renewable standard a long time ago. We totally overshot all the goals. It was better because it's cheaper. It's capitalism, you know? And so the capitalism part is what's really driven the, the green energy and going to continue to drive it. But yet this last session, we're trying to get them to spend money on things like energy efficiency of homes, microgrids. All of these things that basically help the consumer and build up and make our system more resilient from the bottom up, especially like energy efficiency. But like the only thing we got done is demand response. And that's a little bitty program that's going to, you know, just now they're getting to putting the rules out on it. Um, but they created a big fund to save the energy system, to save the energy grid. And what are they spending all that money on? They designated like 95% of that money has to be on gas plants. So the state is subsidizing gas plants because they say this is what will, will be more reliable when we have another winter freeze. Well, that's all hokey BS, basically. I mean, we might need a little bit of gas that can come on in the right emergencies. But the truth is there's so many other more economical ways to strengthen the grid and to avoid that kind of thing. And yet it's because of the money from oil and gas that they basically put this big amount of money into, um, into subsidizing them. And so it's going to, in this next session, we just had a meeting yesterday, same thing. We're all prepared. They're going to go after wind. They're going to tr try to go after solar. They're going to make it like y'all are environmentally bad, make it hard to permit. Every angle that oil and gas can do to make it difficult, They there will be a dozen bills. And so literally they have to be, be on defense. They have to watch for those bills getting slipped into other bills because, you know, they don't play fairly. They want to manipulate the capitalistic system to keep their, you know, old energy on top of um, the the demand pile. And, and you know, they're going to continue to do it, but we're starting to gain more and more influence and so forth. But it just takes time because, again, like we, I get paid probably one, to two percent of what the oil lobby pay, it pays and there's a lot of un, other environmentalists that work in the legislature but i guarantee you if you compared the salaries and the political contributions they're going to be not even proportional and 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 obviously that has an impact and but so I, you know I, I thought that uh the renewables were going to kill us you know the windmills were going to give us all cancer and kill all the birds uh <laughs> So that so I've been told by certain politicians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't it amazing? Yeah, that's I mean it's and it's amazing that they that he's still telling that stuff because you can watch people listening to him and they're rolling their eyes. They know it's not true, uh, but they they still something about you know once you've drank the Kool Aid, um, I guess you got to believe everything the Kool Aid guy tells uh, tells you, you know. Yeah, I, uh, there's two different kinds of Kool-Aid. One kind of Kool-Aid is uh, uh, the Jim Jones kind of Kool-Aid that's got is laced with poison, and then the other kind is the Jerry Garcia kind of Kool-Aid that's got LSD in it. And I don't think you want to drink either one of those if you're trying to come up with sane policy. Sorry, <laughs> Scoop, I I didn't mean to talk over you there. No, I I was just going to observe that you know you and I both grew up in Big Spring in West Texas, and uh, 
my dad was in the gas industry. He ran an LPG refinery just north of Big Spring. So I grew up in that whole environment. And later in his life, my dad ended up having to kind of admit that he screwed up his own life doing that business because they created a problem with the drinking water in Big Spring by uh, they created a giant underground storage area by washing the salt out of a, a salt dome <laughs> underground and they stored product there but the salt had to go somewhere when they washed it out and it went into the groundwater and Big Springs uh, drinking water became toxic and my dad my mom made him go out and bring in jugs of drinking water because the stuff coming out of the tap was you know it would kill you basically so wow he, but you see my dad was in the business that was a solution to that he was in the beer business absolutely. so people could just drink beer and forget the water i tried that <laughs> but it got me into trouble because i was underage <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah what's happening now that's interesting in west texas is um and and you know people are saying that it's due to fracking but it's actually more the uh pumping of the disposal wells and filling of the disposal wells and so forth but all the earthquakes happening in west texas and how those are becoming uh larger and more frequent and you know question is how how long until that becomes an issue of of safety and security where those earthquakes are you know, maybe affecting power plants or schools or other things where people start questioning, you know, how much of this can we handle? I mean, it's not bad right now, but it, it, it could get much worse. And then the other kind of thing I see happening out there is that there, these energy systems are not separated by political philosophy. Like the truth is, is that if you have the ability to produce let's say geothermal out in West Texas, uh, in some places, the remoteness has unique opportunities, but also the connection of the grid that they've done because of oil and gas, and now because of wind, like there are, there are lots of energy products that could explode in West Texas, where we could literally double or triple the capacity of energy coming out of a square foot of land that's only, let's say, a thousand or ten thousand feet away from a major, you know, supply of that power back back east, where it's was needed so much. Like this transformation is already on its way, and the IRA has made it much easier if Texans would take advantage of that money that's out there. And they are in little pieces, but not nearly as much as they could. And so I don't know how quickly this is going to happen, but there will be a transformation of the energy market out there in West Texas. I mean, it already has happened, but it, I'm saying on a new level, um, as all these energy sources become kind of uh, complementary to each other. But I don't know, like I, I've seen people that I ain't deal, drilling no well that's not an oil well. And it's like, well, you're getting gas out of it anyway. You could deal and drill another well and get geothermal. What's the difference? <laughs> you know? Well, you know, you got so out in Howard County and kind of around that area, which is where Scoop and I are from, they have the Wolf Camp Shale, you know, mineral deposits. Yep. They have a ton of oil down there, probably one of the biggest fields of oil that they've ever discovered. But it's really, really hard to get to it. And it probably requires fracking. Uh, it certainly requires a great deal of sophistication and a certain expense to get that oil out. I mean, they, they can't really extract that oil unless oil prices are up, you know, uh, they have to be able to get a pretty good return. Um, so like the other day, Midland had a 5.1 earthquake. Who knows what's going to happen to to Big Spring if they start, you know, regularly using fracking to try to extract that stuff. Um, I kind of don't think they can really get it all out of there. Uh, I know there's a lot of excitement about it, but I just don't, it seems to me that it's, 
the day's going to come when they just have to stop and they're just going to have to leave some of that oil there. Yeah. It'd be all right if they did, wouldn't it? <laughs> leave a little bit of carbon. It would. Yeah, I, it know, absolutely I, would. I don't recall having felt an earthquake in all the many years I lived out in West Texas. And yeah, the closest that we came to feeling like an earthquake is if the uh, fighter jets from the local Air Force base when you know, broke the sound barrier and they give a sonic boom. That was the only disturbance we got. But now they're getting which they did every day. <laughs> it, it's a regular thing now with the uh, earthquakes, and even New Mexico, the oil areas out there are having the same problem: increasing frequent earthquakes. Yeah. It, it, I, I think the science behind that is going to really be a historical thing. We're going we're gonna to be like, wow, we should have seen this coming and we just didn't. And, and I don't know. I mean, I, I hope that it, the science beats the problem where it gets to the point where we can't, you know, do it anymore. Um, or we have to cease it, but that's okay. If we have to cease it, if we have alternative means by that time and we don't need to get to that oil, that's great. Because, you know, again, the the point is, is like we don't have to extract every bit of wealth from West Texas that is in the form of oil. There's a lot of other wealth that these people that own these lands could extract and, and make just as much money, but not, you know, contribute to all the environmental as well as health problems that come from from fossil fuels, you know. Yeah, it's hard for a real good hyper capitalist to turn his back on something that can be exploited. That's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> I got. We're getting so we're getting close to to uh, the end of our time. I I have another question here, um, and I'm just wondering if you have any insight into this. I, I it got really cold here a couple of years ago. And uh, uh, it was pretty disastrous. Texas was in a really deep freeze. Uh, it was sort of unprecedented. Um, what was that? That was Tropical Storm Uri, I think was the name of that storm. Not tropical. <laughs> I'm out of my mind. Winter Storm Uri. Right. Um, and <clears throat> one of the issues that I recall from that time uh, and that's where they first started talking about how, I don't know, the, the wind turbines were causing the problem when obviously they weren't. But, uh, I mean, it was in the gas transmission, uh, was my understanding. But, but part of the problem was that we were completely isolated from the national, like there's two substantial electric grids. Mm -hmm for the US and then there's Texas with its own grid and Texas my understanding was that Texas wants to remain isolated because if they connect to those other grids <clears throat> then they're subject to federal rules which they can otherwise ignore a have I got that right you've got that exactly right I mean it's it's a little more complicated in that there's a way to kind of work out a compromise that lets them not necessarily follow every uh, rule. Um, and there's been some congressional work on making that happen. Um, but yeah, there's just this, it really is ignorance and arrogance combined together, which is to me like the deadliest of all um, combinations because it's the arrogance that, oh, we have our own grid, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Well, take that one further and say, let's sell our damn cheap energy to these other two grids so we can make a lot of money. But no, we're not doing that because we don't want to have to deal with these regulations in D.C. Um, and yet the other thing is, is that if we'd been connected to those other two grids, we could have prevented probably 75 or 80 percent of the power outages that happened when we went down and hey we would get to return the favor someday and but that's the difference between again politicians who say oh dc's their only interest is you know uh breaking us and blah 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 you know and we've got to do our things the texas way so i don't see that like there are bills every session in in the congress to try to fix exactly what you're talking about I'd support them. I think it's a great idea. They're going to study it next legislative session here in Texas. 
Will they get it done? Maybe in six or eight or 10 years when we have a change at, at the top. But uh, currently, I think it's it, it's inside politics controlling it, the big money guys. They're not going to let us get outside of uh, the grid. Yeah, uh, Musk wants to sell us a big ass battery <laughs> to put in. Uh, and they they tend, tend to catch fire, but no big deal there. <laughs> okay, I, I had thought of one other thing that we should talk about. Um, and uh, I'm going to share my screen. Oh, sure. Have you got anything to say about about Texas blue swag? Yeah, so this is a website that we're using mostly just to advertise our stuff. You can actually order stuff on here um, and we will send it to you. But you, you can see it's a, you know, if you click on it at $24 a shirt, like um, that's because we have to deliver them, but we could deliver them anywhere. Um, and so you can order, people can order this from here. But also, like, I'm going to be in Austin selling these shirts at a lot of different events and with people that I know. And so if you're in or around Austin or this area, um, I can get you like shirts are $20, caps are $20. Um, I've got little stickers uh, and we have yard signs too. And the, the yard signs are uh, $15. And they're a little bit more expensive just because um, I've got to cover the cost, but also it goes to the pack. And I'm going to contribute a little bit out of every sale to, again, state house races. And so if anybody's interested, you can see the, the, the website there, um, Texas Blue Swag. Um, and then the other two pieces of information I'd ask you to share are my Act Blue page. Um, if you go to Act Blue and type in Green Wave, W-A-V-E, um, you'll see the green wave pack come up and you can um, see there basically how to contribute to the green wave pack. And what I'm asking people to do again, like if you want to buy some merch or make a contribution to a campaign, that's great. The real work that I want to do is not only win these house cycles, but help us win into the future. And yep, that should be it. Um, and by you know help these candidates um you know have good environmental policies moving forward and so i'd give out my email if anybody wants to contact me and talk to me about what the green wave pack does in more detail or arrange to get some of this good merch delivered at a little cheaper price than the website my email is k flippin k f l i p p i n at gmail.com and I'd love to, you know, work with as many people. I've got people in San Antonio that sell some of my stuff. A guy in Houston that I'm going to deliver some stuff to. So pretty much anywhere you're at, I can probably get you some stuff. I'm going to get new stuff in on the 30th and on the 7th. And I can order more if I have somebody that wants a lot of stuff. And this is throughout this particular uh, presidential race, but I guess you'll have new stuff after... The election's yeah. over, right? Yeah, absolutely. Not and, you know, to, to just show you this, this, this symbol we created, Ian Davis and I started Texans for Obama back in 2007. We did the Auditorium Shores rally. And now we've recreated it. There's over 50 groups across the state that are labeled as Texans for Kamala. And we have house parties and things like that. And so you can um, also find us at um, our Facebook group, Texans for Kamala, and find your local Texans for Kamala group. If you're in Austin or uh, close to Taylor, you can definitely find us as well. We're having a house party, a watch party for the vice presidential debate on October 1st here in Taylor at the venue. And if you wanted to come out there to that, we'd love to have you. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Ken, for joining us today, and let's let's do it again sometime. It sounds good. Thank you all for having me. I appreciate the time. Thanks, Ken. Sure. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. 
With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.